Ladies and gentlemen, you've heard their point. Now, hear the counterpoint on Libertarian Counterpoint Podcasts. Hello, this is uh, Libertarian Counterpoint coming at you on May 29th, 2020, in the midst of all kinds of news. Uh, Some of the big news, aside from the COVID stuff, is we had a Libertarian Party uh, uh, presidential nomination. But before we get to that, uh, my name is Jason McPhee, and I'll be your host today. Uh, up in the left-hand corner, we have uh, Leon Breitwaite, and he is a retired engineer for the state of California. And on the right corner, we have Tim Everett, a uh, uh, pilot in the state of California, our Screaming Eagle of Liberty. And uh, <clears throat> and uh, we'll jump right into the show. Oh, but before that, I wanted to mention, if you have any comments you'd like to make, if you're watching the show live, uh, we will uh, review those at the end of the show. Uh, so about a half hour in, we'll We'll discuss those. And also, too, if you have any personal stories of how COVID uh, may have impacted your business or job, uh, relate those to us. And uh, we may even try and contact you and discuss it with you on the air. Uh, So now getting to the uh, news of the day. Uh, On Saturday, the Libertarians have selected their um, presidential nominee, Joe Jorgensen, and vice presidential nominee, Spike Cohen. And there'd been a lot of talk about Justin Amash and other uh, big names, but uh, that's, uh, um, but we wound up with uh, Joe Jorgensen and Spike Cohen. So uh, I don't know if either of you guys had any thoughts on that. Hmm. I was hoping for, um, uh, ah, his name escapes me. <laughs> um, but they, you're saying that they. Justin Amash? Amash? No, well, no. Mosh is, is out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Jacob. Uh, because Jacob, I already dropped out, yeah. Jacob Hornberger was yes. the guy. I was, uh, I've listened to him talk and everything. And, yeah, he's, he's got some some ideas that that I think are, uh, you know, really hard to imp- difficult to implement. But uh, he's r- really got the right philosophy uh, of, about government, in my opinion. And uh, so you're saying that. Hornberger's out. Everybody else is out. It's already been a done deal. Yeah, I didn't. I, did, I didn't get to vote. Where was the primary? Uh, when well, did I miss it? <laughs> apparently, it was a convention, uh, wasn't it? It was a convention, <laughs> Tim. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Apparently, it's done at a convention, and uh, you uh, know, party delegates show up and they vote for the uh, candidates, and they do a, a certain kind of elimination voting where. Every they vote every round until there's only one standing. So the lowest person on the vote total gets eliminated every round. And so Hornberger, I think, was a uh, or Hornberg or Hornberger. I'm not sure which, but uh, uh, but yeah, Jacob Hornberger, I believe. Okay, yeah, he was a favorite going into all of this, uh, mm-hmm. I think. But uh, um, you know, Joe Jorgensen, uh, she had been a previous vice presidential nominee, I think, of the party. And uh, this time uh, she managed to uh, get the nomination for president. Um, And if you want to go get to know them a little better, uh, for those of you familiar, uh, uh, Google Larry Sharp. He has interviewed both uh, Spike Cohen and Joe Jorgensen. And also uh, LPTV uh, just yesterday did a live stream with both of them. And so I I listened to it and I was uh, pretty impressed with uh, both of the candidates. Joe Jorgensen is a... Uh, psychologist. She has a PhD uh, and she uh, lectures at, um, I'm not sure which university, but it's one of the universities. And, uh, <clears throat> uh, but, uh, you know, she comes across as fairly, you know, um, you know, she's, she's definitely a markets person, more of a, you know, free to choose type of uh, Milton Friedman type is, is sort of the impression I yeah. get. Um, so, uh, you know, and mm-hmm. I think, you know, she sounds great. And, you know, running against two old guys who both sound a little crazy <laughs> at times, you know, yeah. <laughs> you know, maybe there'll be a lot of contrast. I was also impressed too kind of crazy, but yes, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, she, yeah, that uh, sounds almost like a, a better version of Tulsi Gabbard. Uh, although, you know, Tulsi's got her Democrat uh, ideas, but uh, at least her anti-war and anti-surveillance um, things. I mean, it's a good thing she's in Congress, at least fighting that good fight. Um, 
you know, with, with very few people involved uh, with her, you know, that are on her side. But anyway, I like her. But it, this sense, uh, this lady, uh, her name is Joe, like Joseph Joe Jorgensen. Joe, yeah, J-O, or Jill. J O. It's I, I don't know if it's short, J-O. but they, but that's the way okay. it's spelled out there when you do internet searches. It's Joe J O Jorgensen. So Jordan. and I. I I, I think a good catchphrase for people, especially, you know, with libertarians, it seems like you're always kind of scratching your head, you know, when you hear about a libertarian. So I say, you know, hey, let's yeah. get to know oh, yeah. Joe. And so there's, yeah. uh, you know, go, go search some of those uh, recent interviews up. And I think oh, go, you'll be pleasantly go with Joe. surprised. Go, go with yeah, Joe. <laughs> there you go. Go with Joe. <laughs> yeah. You know, I don't, I, I don't have, you know, I, I, the candidates either I didn't have a really strong preference because i um, I have strong libertarian leanings, but I really don't. I'm not a member of the Libertarian Party per se. And about all of these candidates, to me, I mean, in general, you know, I I have some level of agreement with. I have some level of disagreement with. Of course, the biggest one being abortion. I I, re- I really have a big problem with that. So um, I didn't really have a strong preference about any one of them. And I think this woman, I've seen, I've read about her a little bit. Seems seems you know as as good as as anybody else as far as in terms of the libertarians, as good as anybody else. Well, you know, uh, Leon, I, I, just to jump in on the uh, abortion issue, I think that's kind of a split issue in the party. I think there's a fair amount of people who are on both sides of that issue in the libertarian party. Yeah. You know, you know, I, 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 I was wondering about that. You know, you know, you know, Jason, that, you know, I have never met a, a member of the libertarian party, and I've met quite a few over the years, who is um. Who is against abortion? I've never met one. I mean, maybe that's just my my limited my limited world. But I just I, I have had many arguments about this abortion issue with libertarians. Many, quite frankly. Are, but I've never sure met that... somebody. I've never met somebody who have told me they are against abortions. And this have nothing to do with religion. Believe me, my religious. I was raised Catholic and all that. This have nothing to do with that. And I hope one day we can talk about it. Sure. If I was to uh, play devil's advocate, are you sure that the people in, involved that you're remembering weren't against the government intervention in the decision about abortion as opposed to being for or against it for themselves and a, a moral, in, in a, as a moral issue? Uh, the ones... For example, Dr. Uh, Paul, Ron Paul, uh, wanted the abortion uh, government interference to be at the state level instead of the federal level. And You're right, that's true. So, so there's there's kind of, you know, that there's that juxtaposition uh, of positions in, involved in it. Sometimes, at least in the Libertarian Party, you don't hear it very many other places. It's either. 100 percent for or 100 percent against and we'll use the power of government to enforce what we feel is the best uh answer to to the question of abortion so uh, do you remember if they well were... I, I i can't I, I can't really answer that um, okay. um definitively okay mm-hmm. but um my, I, I, I don't want us to get, get off track from this particular show, but I'll just say this and I'll, and I'll shut up about the issue. My problem with abortion starts with our founding document, which says that we are all entitled to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's where it starts. And one day I hope we can talk about it. Sure. Yeah, maybe maybe a very good issue for an upcoming show. And, you know, Leon, I think where the schism might come down is exactly what you're talking about, is it's some libertarians feel that that is life and therefore the government should protect it, uh, you know, because that's the job of, you know, if you are going to have government do any job, protecting individuals' lives is, is uh, you know, from, from aggression is certainly a role for government. But on the other hand, you know, that, you know, there's quite a few other libertarians would probably feel like it's uh, something where it's a complex issue and therefore let's let individuals decide it instead of government. So that's, I think that's, I think that's where the schism kind of comes down on a lot of the uh, thing. But as, as that goes, uh, well, well, let let me make one last comment. I'll shut up. Okay. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we have to, we have to be clear. We have to be clear about whose life we are speaking about. Yeah. Because, 
that thing inside of that woman is a life, regardless of what we, we call it. So we, we, we will have to talk about that. And I, and I, I, I will, I think I have a lot to say about other issues, but which I'll glad to at, at some point in time. Okay. Definitely an upcoming issue, but for now we will, we will abort that discussion. The discussion was a lie. Because if it's not alive, you can't kill it. But we just killed that discussion, which was alive before. And now is not. It's just dead now. Well, well, we promised our viewers we will definitely get to that on an upcoming show. We did have some other uh, more um, uh, current uh, uh, topics to talk about. And one of these is near and dear to Leon, so we didn't want to let that slip again. Uh, and it's Obamagate and the uh, issues around Flynn. Uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, so for those of you who um, aren't familiar with the story, it's uh, it's kind of one of those, you know, in the weeds type of technical stories. We've had this issue where uh, the uh, Obama administration was looking into members of the Trump, uh, you know, uh, incoming administration prior to him coming into office, uh, uh, and that was sort of centered around um, uh, General Flynn, um, yes. and he was the uh, security advisor and national security advisor, yes. national incoming. security advisor, yes. And so, uh, uh, in the issue had to come up with, you know, were they sort of skirting some of these. Um, you know, intelligence rules to be able to spy on the uh, incoming Trump administration. And, and this got a little bit more heated recently because there was an issue with, uh, you know, a technical rule about uh, what they call unmasking. And yes. recently uh, uh, there were quite a few members of the Obama team who had unmasked, I guess, or, or requested an unmasking of of uh, this Flynn, and when when the person becomes unmasked, it essentially allows them to unanonymize the uh, uh, the information that they're that they're right. targeting on him, so that they can uh, you know know who they're talking about beyond just the you know uh, people collecting the information, I guess. And so the um, um, oh, uh, it was uh, Biden. It, it was funny because in one of the uh, interviews, he said he knew nothing about it. And then exactly. it turned out that he was actually one of the people who signed to request for Flynn to be well, yeah, asking, yes. yes. <laughs> so, which, you know, it's a, you know, quite a, but anyways, I'll, I'll let you uh, get into the story further, Leanne, because you're pretty passionate on this one. <laughs> you know, you know, this, your, 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 your comment on the, on, on, on the topic was that, is this too complicated to hood the Democrats? You know, this thing is very a complicated issue, but this thing is really one of the biggest scandals in American history. What we had going on here was one, one, pres one, one administration spying on a, the campaign of an incoming administration and some of the employees of the campaign. And then after the election, the spying continued. This is what happened to General Flynn. General Flynn, as, a national, as the incoming national security advisor, was having a conversation with a Russian ambassador, something that is as normal as breathing the air for an incoming administration. But the FBI and the CIA and all of them were spying on, 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 on well, they were spying on the Russian ambassador as they normally do. But they picked up Flynn in the process. But they had to go after Flynn because Flynn was the head of the, the Defense Intelligence Agency. This is where we, we get in the weeds. And he would have known what they were doing when he came in because he would have been he would have been able to see all the intelligence reports. So they came up with this bogus charge of lying to the FBI, got him to plead guilty by, by threatening his family, threatening his son, and all kind of stuff. This was a massive abuse of government power. And when I talk about massive, it was unbelievable. And what is worst about this, now that the Justice Department under Bill Barr has reached a point where they, they have decided that this case cannot go forward because of the abuse of the Justice Department. The judge in the case is refusing to drop the case now. The Justice Department said, we're not going to prosecute it. But the judge said, no. So now the DC, now they have taken, now, now it's going to go to the DC, um, the, the DC Court of Appeal, and hopefully we'll get some resolution at that point. But we don't know yet. But this abuse started since before Donald Trump became president, and it's continuing even to this day. On General Flynn. 
Well, I do remember, too, at the beginning of this whole scandal, you know, uh, uh, Trump had claimed that he thought his campaign was being spied upon and, right. uh, the, in, in the Obama administration and certainly the media, um, you know, just gaslighted him, essentially trying to, you know, act like, well, you know, you, you must be crazy, you know, that's a, that's a crazy charge. And of course, now we know that it's, it, there's a lot of weight to that charge, uh, of but, uh, but, you know, suddenly people have lost interest in the issue. So, but it's extraordinarily polarized. And, you know, in, in this time when you would think that would be paramount to free and fair elections to assume that, uh, um, you know, whether there was a justified reason or not to even be looking into this, this should be a very, I guess, important issue to everybody because, you know, no. the, the idea of the implements of power can be used to, to work against a, a free and fair election. That's a pretty scary concept, I think, in a democracy. But, and, 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 and one, 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 one other point here, one, one last point. You know, um, the unmasking itself may not be, may, may not be illegal. I mean, you know, I'm sure Biden, prob who was in the last days of the administration, could probably say, oh, he had some intelligence reason why he needed to have the unmasking done. But what is illegal? is the leaking of the name to the press. And it was leaked to the Washington Post in particular. Someone within the Obama administration leaked General Flynn's name to, to the press, to the Washington Post. Now, we don't know who that person is. Now, that is illegal because this was classified information that was passed to the press. So yeah. this was a whole big setup, and we don't know the ins and outs of it. Hopefully, we'll get to the bottom of it. And some people should be prosecuted for this also. Seriously. Well, yeah. The idea that this could have not only affected an earlier election, but now could affect the current election. In the current as well. election, exactly. It's just yes. you know, it's it's mind-boggling the you know the path we seem to be spiraling towards in this in this um, you know this false dichotomy of red and blue. You know, hopefully some people will come to their senses and and find the Libertarian Party. <laughs> all of this, that's all I am. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go, Joe. <laughs> yes, yes. Go, go, with Joe. Joe. go with Joe. Go with the Joe. Go with Joe. Without the E. Yes, without the E. Yes, without the E. Yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, without the E. <laughs> without the E. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm not sure whether they consider libertarian purple, but uh, if it's purple, then go with purple Joe. <laughs> 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 so is it safe to assume that how people look at this Flynn case is totally along party lines and there's no uh, jumping over it be in the, for the sake of uh, what's right and what's just and, you know, that kind of thing? Or is it all along party lines? But uh, for the, the most part, for the most part, hmm. it is cutting along party lines for the most okay. part. There's one very big up exception to this. I don't know if you know who Jonathan Turley is, well-known liberal, but he's a well-known law professor, I believe, at Georgetown uh, University Law School. What's his name again? Jonathan Turley. Okay, Curley, yeah. He is about the only, only left-winger that I know that is talking about the abuse that went on during the Obama administration. He's the only mm -hmm. person I know about. I don't know about anybody else. Maybe there, maybe there is, but I just don't know them. Yeah, that's He's a start, at least. Yeah, that's a start. Yeah, it's good to see that. And you, every once in a while, that kind of thing will crop up, you know, where yeah. you've got somebody willing to buck the system in for the sake of uh, what is right. Sure, so that's sure. good. Yeah. yeah. Wasn't Turley also uh, sort of uh, coming down on Trump's side in the... Uh, um, it was. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Oh, I can't remember the guy's name now, but that uh, independent investigator that was a uh, year and a half long saga. Uh, Mueller? Mueller? Mueller, yeah, that's it, yeah. the Mueller investigation. Mueller. Oh, yeah. Mueller, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I thought, uh, I, thought, I thought Turley sort of came down uh, on one of the decisions on impeachment on his side, too. I, I he did. Can't remember. Yeah. Turley, Turley, as a matter of fact, Turley, as a matter of fact, well, you know, actually, as a matter of fact, there's another person, actually, I, I'm sorry, Alan Dersowicz also, is oh, also, yeah. is also a, a well-known liberal who's, um, who's on, um, who's on General Flynn's side on this case. So, yeah. um, 
I, th- I think the left has tarred and feathered him pretty good, though, <laughs> since yeah, he's yeah, come down on outside on a few issues. Yeah. Well, well, moving into some COVID-related issues at this point. Uh, um, so one of the things that's uh, you know <laughs> seems to be taking a big hit now with uh, uh, you know our shutdowns and everything is the university system. So. Uh, CSU recently announced that uh, that's the whole California State University system has announced that they are not going to hold uh, brick and mortar classes, I guess, for the most part during the fall semester at this point. So they pretty much announced they're shutting down classes. And I'm not sure there may even be a few school districts in different places in the country that may have also be considering similar things. Uh, But it's pretty much everything in the short term has moved to online. And that may be bringing up some big questions about cost and whether or not the paradigm of brick and mortar even makes sense to some degree. Um, do you guys have any thoughts about that? Um, yeah, are they giving a discount for the lack of brick and mortar? You know, I, I don't I know. The if they, I want the I, online know, discount. They, have they given an online discount? <laughs> I, I don't know, but I think it... it, it you know, the stuff I've been exposed to uh, with um, uh, with Tom Woods and and Bob Murphy and a few others is that, uh, yeah, this is going to shine the light on whether you need to get an education sitting in a hall with, um, you know, 200 other students taking notes or whether you can just do it with the technology we have today, like the three of us are doing right now, but yeah. you know, where you have, a, if you're going to listen to a lecture and, and look at something, especially if you are able to um, have it uh, archived where you can re- go back and review it. Um, <laughs> that's, that's, that draws the, it goes into the question of whether or not all these things are actually worthwhile. Now, you know, can, can you, can you do the interaction that, that a lot of smaller classes allow that kind of thing? Um, you know, ask questions and things like that. Well, you know, maybe you could, uh, you know, maybe you could just type a question out and maybe you could, uh, get, a, a one-on-one thing going right there in the middle of the lecture, uh, you know, that everybody else was able to see and so on and so forth. So, yeah, <laughs> what's going to happen? Uh, I, I think there's a lot of changes, and that's just one of them uh, as a result of this. And the other one, of course, is homeschooling. Uh, now you've got, who is this guy that came out, they wanted to make homeschooling illegal. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine, yeah. So, you know, so so, the, so if, if you've got that amount of pushback, then there's, there's something that is uh, uh, scaring them, and they're they're wondering if maybe the gig is up, and and we don't need to have this uh, massive indoctrination program that that occurs in a lot of education. I'm not saying all of it, and I'm not saying everything. You know, I mean, when you learn trigonometry, it's uh, pretty devoid of political influence. But uh, sure. when you hear history and you know economics, you know you don't. When I went to school, and I took all my economics classes, was just uh, introduction to Keynesianism and nothing else. I never heard right. about the Austrian school, or not even the Chicago school, which is right. yes. which is you know pretty close to the Keynesian school in a but just in more disciplined way. And uh, so, yeah, what's all, what's all this going to do? History, especially, and then and then of course, government, which. Um, apparently isn't even being taught in in many situations. I couldn't help but notice you mentioned that math is sort of the one area that's devoid of politics. And of course, that's the one area that seems to be suffering the most under our current situation. I mean, exactly. Exactly. The the status of brick and mortar. Uh, But you know, since, since before, before the COVID, the COVID pandemic, a lot of universities actually were moving to have a very strong online presence. Actually, I used to work for a university part-time at one time, the very university. I worked there for 10 years part-time. Hmm. And their, their online work, I mean, I would say they were like 50-50 in terms of campus versus versus um, versus online. So, so this transition 
to online uh, had started before the pandemic. And now that the pandemic came, I think it accelerated it. And I think some of these uh, some of these universities are not going to go back to their pre-pandemic um, ways. So the brick and mortar might suffer, uh, I, I think, eventually. Now, there are some things that probably can go online, maybe as, you know, like probably chemistry uh, is one probably one good example of that. But a lot of a lot of the university curriculum could go online, and I think it probably will, because it started before the before the pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, you know, it's right. funny. I wanted to get into a few other things, but we're getting near the end of the show. And so, one of the uh, areas that I'm trying to do is a just outrageous quote from somebody in the media. And one of those people this time, this is, so this is our knucklehead noise patrol segment. And so, so the, uh, the target of our ire this week is uh, uh, AOC, Andrea, uh, Andrea Arcadia Cortez. And so she had a uh, oddball quote. Uh, let me see if I can uh, pull it up here. So she had essentially uh, Bill Gates had essentially been trying to coordinate a bunch of philanthropy, essentially billions of dollars in philanthropy. And so uh, under current efforts, I think related to COVID. And so she came out with the snarky quote, if only there were some public fund billionaires could pay into along with everyone else that helps fund our infrastructure, hospitals and public systems all at once. It could even be a modest percent of what they earn each year. Uh, we would have an agency collected in everything. And if it helps, they could think of it as a subscription uh, service to living in an advanced society. Just imagine billionaires paying enough so teachers uh, in the U.S. don't have to work multiple jobs and sell their own blood plasma to survive. Call me radical, but it just might be worth it. And, you know, so that's AOC's quote. And I just can't help but thinking what a silly idea that is when uh, they, these guys, these billionaires are already paying for over 50 <laughs> percent. Yes. yes. <laughs> burden as it stands yeah, so one percent covering you know over half the tax burden already and and the idea that she's you know it, it, they're sitting there trying to figure out a way to pay more and yeah. here she is they <laughs> so, can't, these people yeah. these people can't manage the money that we already give them which is a substantial part of our income anyway they can't manage it but here's aoc trying to tell us we should give we should give the government more than we already than we already give you know, this woman is supposed to have an economics degree from Boston University, but I'm sorry, I know this is not politically correct, but she's as dumb as an ox. She has no <laughs> concept of economics. She don't have no concept of where money comes from. She has no concept of where the tax dollars come from or what caused the creation of wealth and how we, all of us, all our hardworking Americans, fund the government and keep them going. This woman has no concept of it at all, none. I'm sorry, she's as dumb as an ox. <laughs> Tim, did you want to jump in with anything before we uh, before we lose our time? Uh, yeah, Jay. now um, my favorite term is economic imbecile. Uh, I've, I use that on occasion on Facebook. Uh, the occasions are getting less just because I'm tired of uh, you know trying to talk to the wall. But uh, yeah, I mean she she got her education. That was the problem uh, in our university. Uh, that's where she. She got all the Keynesianism uh, and nothing else. And a lot of that is just how to fund the government. And I, are we over time? We are so running over time, just like they're running over budget with all our money. Yeah, so. there, you go. <laughs> there we go. But uh, well, we'll hope to join you next time. And uh, if you're watching live, stick around. And if there's any comments, we will discuss a little more. Or